Good evening, everyone. My name is John Taves, and I'm the event coordinator here at McNally Robinson Booksellers. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that McNally is located here in Treaty 1 territory. That's the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, in the homeland of the Métis Nation. In addition, McNally Robinson Booksellers itself rests on the land once occupied by the Métis community, the Brewster Town. We are delighted to have so many of you here tonight, both in person and virtually, as we celebrate a very special Winnipeg appearance from Michael Crummy, author of The Adversary. It's always a tremendous evening, particularly when you can look around the room and see, oh, there's a lot of writers here tonight. And that is always a good sign for what is to come. Also, last night, we had the pleasure of celebrating uh, an appearance from Emma Donahue. Today, we have Michael Crummy here in the store. There are times where I feel a little bit selfish that I'm getting paid to sit back and listen to these events, which is a statement I likely should not make in front of my boss. <laughs> This conversation will, of course, be hosted by Chris Hall, who I'll be introducing in just a moment. And we're presenting this in partnership with our very good friends at the Winnipeg International Writers Festival. It's always such a joy to be able to collaborate, conspire with them. And this is part of Thin Air 2023 as they bring the festival home. Now, just a few quick. Yes. Of course, I'd be remiss if I did not actually thank Knopf Canada as well, because without them, we would not have a book nor a reason to gather. So many thanks to Knopf for publishing this. Uh, just a few very quick procedural notes, and then I will get out of the way of tonight's entertainment. Uh, there will be a reading from this podium from Kremen, and following that, there'll be a conversation taking place to my left. After that, there will be an opportunity for all of you to ask questions, so you can start formulating those now. When your question does occur to you, please just put up your hand and I'll rush over to you with a microphone. Not to comment on your ability to project, it just ensures those watching at home can actually hear your question. And if you are one of those folks watching at home, feel free to just write your question into the chat and we will put them to Michael as time permits. Now, the only thing I will put in your brain about the procedure after the event, because Charlene Deal from the Writers' Festival will come up here to wind everything down, is that we will ask you all to remain in your seat for just one moment while we safely transport Michael to the signing table. <laughs> what kind of a crowd is this? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you in advance. <laughs> there will be more thrilling signing notes uh, at the end of the event, so stand by for those. But now your host for this evening, Chris Hall, has been with McNally Robinson Booksellers for more than 25 years, more than 10 of which is owner. When he isn't reading or walking, he loves to travel and cook. He lives in Winnipeg and is currently training his daughters to be booksellers. <laughs> now, Crummy's new book, The Incredibly Acclaimed Adversary, which is a follow-up to his previous book, The Innocence, which many of you, I'm sure, have read and loved, is an incredible... Yes. I'm going to make you applaud on multiple occasions. <laughs> a dark and thralling novel about love and its limitations, the corruption of power, the power of corruption, and pirates. Uh, so Michael is here. He is the author of the memoir, Newfoundland, Journey into a Lost Nation, seven books of poetry, including Arguments with Gravity, winner of the Writers Alliance of Newfoundland and Labrador Book Award for Poetry, and the short fiction collection, Flesh and Blood. His first novel, River Thieves, was a finalist for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, and his second novel, The Wreckage, was a finalist for the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize. His third novel, Galore, won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize. I get to say prize a lot. Canada and the Caribbean, and was a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award. His fourth novel, Sweetland, which is an amazing book, was also a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award. His most recent novel, Prior to the Adversary, was a finalist for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, the Rogers Writers' Trust Fiction Prize, and the Governor General's Literary Award. He lives in St. John's, Newfoundland, but is here with us tonight. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Michael Cohen. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's great to be back in Winnipeg. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces, including some I didn't expect. Um, uh, it was great. I, Charlene Deal from the 
from the festival picked me up at the hotel. And uh, Charlene and I go way back. I read at her class in Ontario, I'm gonna say almost 25 years ago. Is that more than 25 years ago when I was five? And, um, <laughs> and she, so when she saw me today at the hotel, I guess I sh when I showed up at her class, I was wearing a lumber jack shirt and ripped jeans and stuff. And so when I came out today, she looked at me and she said, well, you look quite swish. <laughs> and uh, I, I had to, of course, defend myself against that. So I pointed out that this jacket, which is a Tiger of Sweden. And if you go online looking for a Tiger of Sweden jacket, there's somewhere between four and $600 each. And I got mine at Value Village in St. John's <laughs> for 25 bucks. Um, swish, yes, but still cheap as hell. <laughs> Um, Winnipeg relates. Winnipeg relates, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I'm going to read just a short passage from this book. Um, and I apologize to those of you in the room who've already heard me read this passage from this book. Um, the adversary is, uh, it's not a sequel to The Innocence. You don't have to have read The Innocence to read this book. But it is kind of a companion book. Uh, it's in a way a mirror image of The Innocence. So The Innocence is a book about a, uh, a brother and sister orphaned and left to their own devices in a small cove in Newfoundland at the turn of the 19th century. And uh, they find themselves in incredibly difficult circumstances, as you can imagine. And part of the reason they survive those circumstances is because they love each other. And their most fervent, fervent wish is for the other person to survive. Even when they don't like each other very much, even when the relationship becomes incredibly complicated, that is still at the root of everything they feel. And I've always talked about it as a kind of a twisted Adam and Eve story. And those of you who've read the book will know why. Um, when I started thinking about what I might do for another book, um, when I was doing the research for, uh, for The Innocence, I did come upon an historical figure who I was really interested in, uh, but I couldn't get him into The Innocence. It was, a, it was a guy who was a merchant in Newfoundland around the turn of the 19th century. And this guy was just a total asshole, like a drinker, a brawler, a braggart. He shot and killed an Irish servant during an argument. Um, uh, he was punished for that by shortly afterwards being made a justice of the peace on the shore. As justice of the peace, he recruited and imported a, a group of prostitutes from the capital city of St. John's to the place where he was living and set up his own brothel. Um, he seemed to me to be the exact opposite of everything that was good in those youngsters. And because The Innocence was called The Innocence, which was kind of arbitrary, but I started, I was thinking a lot about uh, Blake's Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience and how that's uh, two lyric poem sequences that Blake wrote, I think in the 1800s, uh, that he said explored the contrary nature, two contrary natures of the human soul. And Songs of Innocence is just that. It's about kids playing in the fields and lambs frolicking and spring, you know, all those good things. And Songs of Experience takes the same setups, but flips them on their head. So it's about kids hungry on the streets of London or being forced to work as chimney sweeps, lambs being taken to the slaughter. And I started to think, could I do something like that? Take, not write a sequel, but write an exact mirror of an image. So that's what I've tried to do. And the adversary starts at the exact same time that the innocent starts and it ends around the same time. But it takes place in the community that we hear about in The Innocence, but never visit in Montmagre. And uh, so I had all this set up in my head. I thought I had a book and I just could not get started. Uh, I didn't know what the story was until it finally occurred to me that if this was a mirror image book, then this guy had to have a sister. So, uh, and as soon as I thought of that, 
I had, it felt like I had a story. And instead of an Adam and Eve story, it became a Cain and Abel story. So the two main characters are Abe Strap, who's uh, so useless uh, that his nickname is not Abel. <laughs> and, uh, and his sister, who's known only as the Widow Keynes. So I'm just going to read a short section from near the beginning of the book, which talks a little bit about their childhood and uh, presents some of the reasons for why uh, there's such, not all of them, but some of the reasons why there's such animosity between the two. As a girl, the widow collected all manner of wild creatures, ladybugs and spanny tickles and frogs and baby birds, keeping them in jars or in dippers filled with water or in boxes lined with grass. When she was 11, a servant shot a deer behind the outbuildings on Strap's property. There was a weeks old calf that refused to leave its dam lying dead on the ground. The widow had the fawn placed in a crib built for goats where she fed it by hand until the animal was tame enough it followed her around and slept on her bedroom floor like a dog. But she didn't name her animals or mourn their deaths with childish funerals. She fed the dead frogs and birds to the hunting dogs. Her connection to the menagerie was proprietary, a dominion she curated out of indifferent curiosity. She spent hours drawing the limbs and heads and wings of the animals from various angles. There was no denying the aptitude of those sketches but there was something unsettling about her appetite for dissection, a beak, an ear, the claws, the webbed feet, as if there was some truth that could be discerned only by taking a creature apart and examining one element at a time, as if the sum would prove greater than the whole in the end. She had an unnatural desire for learning as well, taking up reading and writing at an early age. She was seven years old when her mother died giving birth to her brother, Abe Strap and her whole life turned to books and study as if there was consolation for losing a mother in them. She attended the school on her father's property each day and went from there to the mercantile offices where she occupied herself by copying the hand and signatures of Cornelia Strap and the Beadle and the mercantile officers she found in company correspondence. Over time, she became more interested in the numbers in the company ledgers. To avoid her relentless interrogations, Cornelius had a junior accountant teach her credit and receivables, payables, margins, loans, and interest. Her understanding outstripped her tutors in short order, and at 14, she set to work at the business in earnest. She never completely abandoned her habit of sketching, and she dedicated part of each day to drawing in a leather-bound book, but the business of numbers and their relations became her main preoccupation. Everyone but the Quakers, looked upon the girl's mercantile education as an abuse. Even the elder Strap suspected he was doing his daughter a disservice. I expect she will never find a suitable husband, Cornelius admitted to his head man. Clinch pursed his lips. He was of the same mind, but had never happened on the chance to say so. She could be a fine housewife as long as she's kept in some awe, he said. She will need a husband who can govern the greatness of her spirit. I wish the poor man luck, Cornelius said, whoever he may be. It might serve her, the beetle said, to be put in charge of her brother's welfare rather than spending her days among the ways of the world. You've given this some thought, Mr. Clinch. The beetle had never reconciled himself to the girl's presence in her father's place of business. She arrived each day with the tame deer in her wake like a royal ascending a throne in a great hall, taking a seat among the men she looked upon as serfs and vassals with that dumb beast attending. That absurd pairing seemed deliberately designed to mock the world as it was ordered and ordained, and Clinch finally insisted the animal be left outside, the two arguing the matter with a fierceness that suggested it was the girl himself he wished to ban, which they both knew to be the truth of the matter. Even though her father took the headman's side in the dispute over the, over the deer, the girl's imperious tendency of thought grew in her like a malignancy. Her impulses were all contrary to a woman's character, and given the opportunity, Clinch couldn't resist suggesting a radical corrective. Your son is long past the age to begin his education, he told the elder Strap. His sister would be a fine tutor, and it might spark a maternal interest more becoming in the girl. From your lips, Cornelius said, to God's ears. 
Her brother had been raised by servants instructed to indulge his every whim. He was wet nursed by a young mother and insisted on taking the tea until he was four years old when the woman finally refused to carry on. For months afterward, he grabbed at the servants' breasts, trying to haul down their aprons and blouses to suckle, sending the house up with a tantrum when they fended him off. He'd never taken much to table manners or even to wearing stockings or trousers. He'd been sent to school with other children his age, but he would not sit still for two minutes at a time and chase the girls around the schoolhouse, holding his bald cock like a pistol and squealing as he tried to piss on their skirts and shoes. Even though her salary was paid by Cornelia Strapp, the teacher refused to hold classes with Abe in attendance, and eventually he was kept home. He had no interest in any bookish undertaking or instruction. The only discipline he respected were his sister sketches, which he looked upon as a kind of magic that he demanded to be taught. The infantile and cockeyed figures he could manage infuriated the boy. He despised his sister for holding the talent to herself as if she'd stolen something that rightfully belonged to him. And he defaced her sketches with charcoal scrawls or burnt them in the fireplace. She retaliated by holding him by the ear and driving the alphabet into his head as if she was hammering nails through a board. They each saw in the other the antithesis and obstacle of all they valued and wanted from the world. Each day was a contest of wills that descended into physical confrontations, the sister holding the upper hand at first by dint of her size, despite Abe's fondness for kicking for using his nails and teeth. He would pinch her tender breast between a thumb and forefinger and hold on for dear life as she beat him across the head and shoulders. She went to her father repeatedly, asking to be returned to her old life, but he insisted almost sorrowfully that it was her duty to be a helpmeet to her brother. Even then, she recognized the Beatles' words in her father's mouth. Clinch argued it was in the best interest of both children to stay the course. It would teach the daughter humility, he said, and the boy might learn something of use in the struggle. On both fronts, he was disappointed. At the end of the arrangement, Abe could do little more than sign his name with a pen. What he knew of numbers and maths, he learned elsewhere, playing at cards and dice. And his sister's masculine arrogance showed no sign of abating, despite her circumstances aligning more closely with a woman's nature and due. By the time Abe was 11, he largely absented himself from her lessons. He was introduced to firing the flintlock and pistols, and he wandered the back country in search of something to maim or kill. The deer his, his sister had raised from a fawn was full grown by then, and Abe shot a dead one winter morning in response to some pedagogic humiliation. The balance of power between the siblings had reversed, and Abe left his tutor with bruises on her arms and legs and breasts with blackened eyes. Cornelius Strapp finally called a halt to the arrangement to avoid permanent injury to one or the other of his children. The widow returned to the firm's offices where she proceeded to make herself indispensable, working through accounts with a speed and prudence that seemed second nature, offering opinions whose reason and soundness couldn't be denied. She worked there six days a week until her brother's 16th birthday, when her father legally changed the firm's name to C. Strapp and Son Company Limited. New signs were placed over the offices and the warehouses on the waterfront, and she never entered the doors of those buildings again. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for that. My pleasure. And uh, welcome back to Nelly Robinson and Winnipeg. Thank You've you. Been here a few times. You were saying earlier. I have, yeah, in this space a couple of times. In fact, it's yeah, it's a fabulous bookstore. <laughs> well, it's a great city. Sort of so it's yeah, I love being here. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's nice to have you back. I have more and more friends moving here. Actually, and I, was I heard. I heard uh, at, as I was coming up that there was uh, they were going to attempt a draft <laughs> to try and get uh, myself and my wife, my wife Holly over here. Okay. <laughs> You never know. You never know. All right. We are open to bribes. <laughs> and a nice chat. And nice chat. <laughs>
Um, so to start, I wanted to kind of ask you a general question about your writing. You're, you're fond of a particular setting, time and place, Newfoundland <clears throat> in the past. Are yeah. you know, all five of your novels set in Newfoundland in the past? Uh, not, not technically. Okay. Um, like Sweetland is a, is a story that's basically yeah. torn from the headlines. It's, uh, it's about the resettlement issue in Newfoundland currently that for the last uh, 20 years. It's, it was a big thing in the 50s and 60s into the 70s where smaller communities were being paid by the government to move to larger communities. It's hugely controversial, caused a lot of bad blood, and they gave it up because it was such an awful process. But uh, after the COD moratorium in 92, um, communities started going to the government and saying, listen, we don't have anything here now. Pay us, buy us out, and we'll move somewhere else. But uh, again, hugely controversial. So Sweetland is about a community that uh, wants to take the package except for one guy who refuses to leave. So, and the second half of the book is him after he's faked his death, staying alone on the island. So even though it's completely contemporary, the second half especially, it feels like Newfoundland 200 years ago. So there is something about that world that I am, uh, I am drawn to helplessly, it seems. <laughs> and do you know what that something is? Like, what is it well, I've had to think about it, right? Um, I mean, I keep saying I never intended to be an historical novelist. In fact, I actively did not want to be seen as a historical novelist just because it feels like a pigeonhole and it feels limiting somehow. Um, but it's getting harder and harder to be pissed off at people for calling me a historical novelist. Uh, I got a lot of work to do if I want to escape that pigeonhole. Um, so I've had to think about what is it about that time. And on, honestly, uh, I don't know. Hmm. But I do think, I've, I've thought for a long time now that uh, one of the things that the modern world does for us or does to us is it gives us a very false sense of how much we have control over in our lives. Um, you know, uh, I think the pandemic shook some of our faith in how much we have control over. But speaking for myself, like I grew up in the age of universal health care, of penicillin and antibiotics, um, fairly stable political circumstances. And it felt like we had escaped a lot of the uncertainty that it that for most people through most of history was part and parcel of being human. And when I look back at even a generation ago at my father's time in Newfoundland pre-Confederation and a hundred years before that and 200 years before that, um, those were communities and lives where it was impossible to disguise how vulnerable people were and impossible to pretend that you were in control you know, so much of those people's lives was trying to uh, avoid what they couldn't control and, and then just living with it if they weren't able to avoid it. And there's something so naked about that. Um, and it affects how people think of themselves in the world in a way that I think is really uh, important for us to see in our own lives, even though it's not nearly as obvious. So I, that's my answer at the moment. That's a good one. We distract ourselves with comforts. So yeah, that. yeah. Hmm. Um, you, you talk about the innocence uh, um, earlier uh, and how it fits. Usually when I'm, I was aware that the new book was, was related, but I just assumed prequel, sequel, but I was, um, there was a moment it, it felt kind of pleasant that uh, they were concurrent happening right. at the same time. There's a few, a few moments where it make, you make it obvious. There's a there's a shoe that makes a reappearance, and a cheese, and a telescope, and uh, the Duke of Limbs. Yeah. Now, the Duke of Limbs in Innocence is just a figure on a boat. Yeah. But he comes fully equipped with his nickname. That's yeah. a big impression on Ada. And then we, in the later book, we get this backstory about where the nickname came. It, it feels like you set that up and you were preparing for that, but I'm gathering you. Yeah, no, there yeah, was no backup. There was no prep. Yeah. There was I had I had no idea that I was going to uh, to write another book connected to the innocence. Um, and I've never really been interested in sequels. 
like when I finish a book, I feel like I'm done with those characters. Like I've been asked sometimes, you know, do those characters live on in your life? Do you wonder what they're doing now on the other side of the story you've told? And I don't. It, like this, the story that interested me is between the covers. And I still think of them in there. So all of that stuff, like something like the Duke of Limbs was just a, a like a really arbitrary thing where um, he just uh, Ada sees him from the shore. He's on the boat, and but he's such a beautiful character that she's incredibly struck by him. Um, and I had found that phrase, the Duke of Limbs, in uh, in uh, I think it was the Dictionary of Newfoundland English. It just means somebody who's tall and gangly, right? So that's the Duke of Limbs. And I, I was also I spent some time uh, reading the uh, Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue, and there's a. a, a a phrase in there, which is a very sort of clever racist way to refer to people of mixed race, which is, uh, oh, he's got a lick of the tar brush about him. And just those two things created in my mind this character who was just a walk on. And we know we see, we see him very, really briefly, and he's mentioned. But, but part of what I loved about the idea of writing this book that ran concurrently was uh, the challenge it was going to present to find ways to have all of the stuff that was completely arbitrary when I was writing The Innocence show up in this book in a way that felt organic. And that was, that didn't feel like I was just, this is only here because it was in the last book and I couldn't avoid it. But that it was here because it is integral to this story that I'm telling. So uh, I, I was really adamant in my own mind that I wanted all of the people who had shown up washed up on the beach in the innocence to wash up on the beach in this one as well so i had to come up with a way to get the duke of limbs into mock bigger and when i used to uh, i don't know if you were here when i read from the innocence but i used to introduce it by saying um you know if it wasn't for the incest and the cannibalism and the marauding pirates it'd be a more or less straightforward coming of age story <laughs> And then I'd say, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. There's no pirates. There's no pirates in that book. Um, so in this book, I thought, well, there's got to be pirates. So, uh, so I created this whole story. And it's based on true events, like this kind of holding a community hostage by American privateers. It happened in Twillingate. It happened on the Labrador coast. Um, so that, to me, was the way to get this young Haitian boy into a community on the northeast coast of Newfoundland and then to create a story that wound into the, the lives of the characters there. And that, that for me is the most pleasurable part of writing where you take a whole bunch of really arbitrary things that are not connected in any way and then you create some kind of storyline that makes it feel like these things belong together and couldn't exist without each other. Mm. Well, yeah, I was thinking the, uh... They take place concurrently, but also distance from each other. That's right. Their settlements quite a bit yeah, because the, the so we never we never see Ada and Everett, the, right. the kids from the Innocent Side. So not in this book. They're mentioned once or twice, really briefly, but of course they're in a cove, at least a day's sail away. So just as we never see Mock Beggar in in the Innocents, we never see the cove in the adversary. And so it's like two different worlds where those stories are happening at exactly the same time. And yet they're beautifully intermingled, just like you, the stories are. Yeah. yeah, oh, thank you. I mean, it was a real, I knew it was going to be a real challenge yeah. because when I was writing The Innocence, you know, if I thought at a certain point the story, you know, it's two kids alone in a cove for 300 pages, like what the hell am I going to do to make that interesting? So I thought, well, if I had a big storm at this point, that would be really useful to me as a writer. Or if a sickness comes into the cove, that would be really useful at this point. But I could place those wherever I felt like the story needed it. But when I was writing this book, all of those things had to happen when they happened. And I couldn't change that. So it was a completely different challenge to try and find a way to tell a story an independent story that incorporated all of those things and to make it feel like um, it wasn't a guy sitting in his underwear somewhere in St. John's <laughs> sewing those things together in a way that you know was completely unnatural. <laughs>
<laughs> so um, you my underwear is not secondhand, by the way. Underwear's new. I was going to stop on, on the clothing uh, angle, but uh, um, I'm going to talk about Abe. Now you've talked about him a little bit. Yeah. Here. If anything, I was wondering if he's so malevolent. It's almost like he's right at the edge of believability. But then you tell us it's nonfiction. It's uh, it's one of those things that nonfiction is stranger than fiction. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think. He, both Abe and the and the widow. The widow is more interesting um, because Abe is just appetite, mm -hmm. and um, and he's he's a blunt instrument all the way through the book. Um, but for a writer, that's kind of a dead end, right? I think that was part of the reason I couldn't start before I had the widow in my mind because uh, this is a guy who does not change through the entire course of the book, and the widow doesn't either, right? Um, but what I had decided, part of my motivation for writing this book was an attempt to write through my own uh, sense of dread and anger and uh, frustration about the way the world has been unfolding over the last eight, 10 years, you know, where we have seen the people who, like politics is so ugly now that uh, the only people who go into it are people uh, without a soul to begin with, is what it seems like. And I don't want to paint too broad a brush, <laughs> but it does feel like um, there's a particular kind of narcissistic sociopath who <laughs> has the tools that you need to be able to survive in that world, right? And in the corporate world as well. Um, and, uh, and it felt like we were all in one way or another uh, under the thumb increasingly of people like that. And um, so I decided what I wanted to do was to take the worst of the world that I had, as I had seen it over the last decade or so, and try to recreate those dynamics in this tiny Newfoundland outport 200 years ago. And so what I had, I think, are two characters who are like black holes, who, um, because from the little bit I read, you will probably sympathize with the widow. And it's a natural tendency of writer, readers, I think, because of the circumstances she's born into, to feel a, a, a certain kind of sympathy with her. I think what the book, where the book goes, though, as it, as it unravels, is um, we see that both of those characters, although they're completely different in how, what they value, completely different in how they operate in the world, they are both exactly the same in the sense, and that is that they're only capable of having relationships with other people or institutions that are transactional. What can I get from this person? What can I get from my association with this business or institution? And, um, um, and it's a, there's a danger in writing characters like that because they can seem not quite real. But I think we've all seen enough of them <laughs> on our television screens lately to, to, to recognize them for what they are. So what interested me in the book as a, as a writer, to a large extent, was who ends up being sucked into the orbit of those black holes? Who makes a decision to step into the orbit? Who's dragged into it unwillingly or by accident? Uh, and what what are the motivations that lead people there? And what does that mean for them in the end? You know, and turn, turns out it's not good. It's just very bad. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> um, you don't name the widow. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, no, the widow is known only as the widow or the widow Kings. And uh, it was mostly just because of the, the uh, Cain and Abel thing. So I wanted to, uh, uh, as much as possible, avoid having people think of her as something else. So I just decided I would not tell us what her name was to, to sort of have the Keynes name front and center as much as possible. But that was really as, as far as I took that in my head. Yeah. Um, in some ways you, you sum up everything you've just said in your uh, epigraph, the proverb. Um, I'll read it. The, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. Right. There's a the ambush, the active, the lie in wait, the passive, the haves, the have-nots, the powerful, the the, uh, the no power. It, it um, 
at the same time, there's there's a force that is greater than all of them, and so both of them are are in danger, I and mean, both of them are uh, are obviously in for bad things, as you say. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have the, well, the other epigraph is about black holes, right, yeah, and about how uh, uh, black holes don't emit light, but uh, the, the things that are in the orbit of a black hole uh, set off, <clears throat> create a, a kind of a glowing accretion disk that, that you can see. And so for me, uh, these two black holes are orbiting each other in the book. And when two black holes orbit each other, eventually one swallows the other. So the question is, which one swallows the other? But what really interested me as a writer was the, the accretion disk the light around them of these other characters being dragged into that orbit. And again, asking those questions. And, and I made up my mind before I started writing it that I was not going to intervene, you know, because my tendency as a writer is, I mean, I don't write happy books. I know that, <laughs> I know that. Um, but my, uh, my tendency as a writer is even in the worst characters, I am scraping for the one little bit of humanity in that person. Um, and even in the darkest endings, I'm always hoping that there's some sliver of light somewhere in the book that carries through to that end or past. Um, but I, I thought if I'm setting up this circumstance where the worst of what we're living with now is set in motion, and, uh, and I want to show what that means. If there is no intervention, then I can't intervene. And I can't save any of these characters. And I can't have a sliver of light that shows at the end. Because if those dynamics are set up and you just let them go and there is no intervention, then I think there is no sliver of light. You know? And I, it was really hard for me to not, there were a lot of characters in this book that I, I really loved. And I knew when I was writing them where they were going to end up, you know? And it was hard to, to just let that happen. Mm -hmm. The overall arching all of them, of course, is uh, what you were talking earlier about. It's just sheer survival, especially in innocence, but, but equally uh, yeah. for many of them. You know, other, and I'm, I was struck by a line in, from the innocence where Everett is learning how to shoot with Captain Truss and they they find a mother bear in a cub and they shoot mother bear and kill her, but they wound the baby bear. They blind it, but they leave it. And they, and yet you write, they, they abandon the blind cub to the in, indiscriminate work of nature. Hmm. I thought that's your character, but it's these people. They're, they're really, they're, they're powerless against I mean, I think that's part of the helplessness that, or the like, the knife edge that I've always seen in those lives, right? That uh, I, I've been saying for a while now. You know, like Newfoundlanders, the old joke about Newfoundlanders is that they'll they'll be the only unhappy people in heaven because they'll all be wanting to go home to Newfoundland. And and it's there's a lot of truth to that. Um, but I have always felt that the place it's an unrequited love. Like the place does not return that affection <laughs> at all. And, and so it, it doesn't, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Like it's like an abusive relationship where, um, where the place, I mean, it, it offers enough to survive on. But outside of that, uh, it, it was a really wicked place to try and make a go of it. And in some ways, the adversary in this book and in all of the books I've read, is the place itself. And the people recognize that, right? Um, and the adversary in this book, of course, is the brother and sister. But for each of these characters in the end, the adversary we all face is ourselves and our own motivations and wanting something that we know is gonna end badly, but we're driven by our own greed or by our own uh, hatred or our own grief to do things that uh, don't end well for us or anyone else. So the sliver of light, the, there is some slivers of light. The, it seems to me the you have two siblings in each, younger siblings, I should right. say. They're all both, or they're all four, I guess, about 12. Yeah. Ada and, and um, 
and Everest. And Everett, of course, yeah. Solomon Bride. Yeah. So is that what that what those figures are offering in these books? Are they well, in a sense, it's the eternal hope? Or? Yeah, I know. I mean, I feel like I, I have too many spoilers here, but <laughs> right. um, you know, in this book at the end, the young are sacrificed. And that's uh, for me, because they are so much like Ada and Everett, you know, like that was, so I think of this book as a mirror image of that last book, but it's a, a shattered mirror, so there are pieces of it all over the place. And, and Solomon and Bride were very much Ada and Everett in my head. Uh, and, you know, and, and whereas the innocence ends with a birth, um, this book ends with a murder. And what lies past that, what's not written, is um, is not something that's going to go well for for those youngsters. So for me, the youth, like the the youth in the innocence, is the sliver of light, and that love between them is the light. Mm -hmm. And in this book, of course, that's sacrificed by someone who has given these kids the impression that she's on their side, and then uses them to her own devices without a shred of second thought or guilt. And it does seem to me that we're in a world now where the youth are being, the youth will be sacrificed, right? Unless we make, I mean, wholesale changes doesn't begin to say what needs to happen. You know, we've lived through an eight month period where it's pretty clear we are in a climate crisis. It's not coming, it's here. Uh, and um, even if we make those changes now, this is the new normal, like it, it doesn't back up. And if we wait another 10 years, then whatever things will be way worse and that will be the new normal if we change, change things there. So it's really the, the young people who will be living with those things, you know, and that feels to me like an absolutely criminal, yeah, a dark, dark thing that we will have to live with. Mm -hmm. Wow, this far Sorry. Away. Hey, yeah. thanks for coming out, Winnipeg. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about my underwear some more. Uh, see if we can bring this out a little bit. <laughs> Before we do, um, I wanted to talk about the Beatle. Yeah. He's a figure in both yeah. books. Yes. He's got a role, a much bigger role in Innocence as well as in the one. And he is an authority figure. He's like he kind of represents a church, the church, or he brings the ideas of church, but also business, like the yep. logic of, of economics and debt and things like that. Yeah. What uh, What can you tell us about the Beatle? Well, the Beatle, the Beatle is the headman for Cornelius Strat's uh, operation, and the headman was kind of the the enforcer's too strong a word, but he was the guy who made all the decisions in terms of uh, what was given out on credit. He kept track of everything that was given out on credit to the fishermen. He was the guy who uh, judged their fish when it came in and assigned a value to it. And he balanced those ledgers. So he had an incredible amount of power. Um, and also the beetle is a, a term for a lay person in the church. And of course, in, in Mark Beggar, the minister had died 20 or 30 years before and they'd never been able to find someone to replace them. So he has become the figurehead of the church. So in many ways, he's the locus of power in this community and on the shore. Um, and in the innocence, although there's a lot of fear, the kids have a lot of fear around this character who they don't really understand his power or why their lives are beholden to him. He actually goes out of his way in a couple of cases to make it possible for them to survive. Um, in this book, um, he plays a much bigger role in terms of moving pieces around the chessboard. And he is somebody who absolutely despises Abe Strap, who is his godson. Um, but he sides with Abe because for ideological reasons, the thought of the widow being in a position of power in that community is complete anathema. And he sees her almost as a devil character. Um, so he's like those people who, uh, when Trump got elected, decided, okay, I don't really like this guy, 
but he's a Republican and I'm a Republican and I hate those other guys. So I'll just tie myself to this wagon. And there will be adults in the room who can uh, curb his worst instincts. And we know how that went. <laughs> so it's the same sort of thing in this book where he, he has the sense that somehow he'll be able to control a and uh, as it turns out, of course, that's the uh, pipe dream. Yeah. yeah, you can't control either a uh, black hole. Yeah, yeah, in the end, he's just in the orbit and about to cross the event horizon, although he's not aware of it, which I understand is correct physics. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> You're crossing the event horizon, you don't know, it's too late. We'll let it go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm an English major, so. <laughs> so before I turn it over to the audience, I, I wanted to get you to talk about the language in the book a bit because sure. it's such a such a pleasure to read. Even when I didn't know the the actual definition of a word, it just the context did enough. Maybe I didn't know the exact shape of an right. object, but it was it felt close enough. Yeah. Can you talk about the language in the book? Yeah, I mean, part of what I've done when I'm writing these historical books is I've tried to make it as authentic as possible. And that includes by knowing about the social warriors at the time and how people wore and kind of buildings and lived in, how they fished. But I also worked really hard to try and know as much as possible how people spoke. And for every book I've ever written, the Dictionary of Newfoundland English has been my go-to. And it's, it's one of my desert island books. Like it's, it's about five or 600 pages. And it's now also all online if you want to go have a look at the DNA. Um, and it is an incredible work of scholarship. Um, they spent, I think, a couple of decades collecting uh, and annotizing uh, the, the thousands of ways that Newfoundlanders adapted and created English um, to fit the new reality that they found themselves in. And uh, it's just people were so unbelievably uh, creative and hilariously funny and cutting and uh, and some of it is heartbreaking. So I just love going back and reading through it. And a lot of it comes from that. But when I started uh, researching the innocence, I realized this is far enough back that most of the characters are not actually Newfoundlanders. They're Europeans, they're Brits or Irish. And uh, so I went looking for something to help me with that. And I found something called uh, the Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue, which was uh, compiled in the 1780s or 90s and then updated in 1811. And at the time, vulgar just meant uh, common. So it was how people spoke on the docks and in the bars and in the brothels. And, and again, it was so unbelievably entertaining. Uh, a lot of it was how people insulted each other. Uh, it was uh, the vulgar ways they would refer to uh, sex or to uh, people who worked in the sex trade. Um, uh, and it was, so I went out of my way to write, when I was writing a scene that involves characters who were from that place in that time, I was always uh, writing conversations and thinking, what would work here? So if they were going to insult one another, I would go back to the vulgar tongue dictionary and find a way <laughs> to insult someone. And there was there was so much there that uh, there's one scene where uh, when when Abe brings the prostitutes from St. John's and he's setting them up in his old childhood home, and the abbess, who's the the, the mistress of the of the prostitutes, is asking, "Well, how many bedrooms are upstairs?" And and Abe says, "Well, there's three up there, and there's also the the servants' room at the back." And she says something like, um, I imagine it's seen as share of the, the old art of basket weaving. And Abe doesn't know what she means. So then she offers another one and Abe doesn't know what she means. And then she just runs through this list of all the ways you can describe sex without saying sex <laughs> until she hits one that Abe understands. And I wrote that entire scene just so I could list <laughs> all the ways that they referred to sex. Uh, just because it's so, um, you know, it's it's reflected glory. Like a lot of people talk about the the creativity of the language and stuff in there, and a lot of it I'm just stealing, you know. <laughs> and uh, so the trick for me then is to create a circumstance and a conversation that 
makes it feel like those things belong uh, and then aren't just something that I sort of clipped out of a dictionary somewhere. I had to read that list a couple of times. Really, <laughs> I'm on the innocence. So. Yes, right, of course. Um, okay, I'm going to put the uh, audience work hand over the microphone. I do have a couple of plans if you're shy, just to get things going. <laughs> Don't make them ask those questions, please. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to ask if you have a system. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering, you talked a little bit about how you um, named the Widow Kings or why you named that, but I'm wondering if by stripping her of a name and, and by any kind of identity through name other than, you know, by marriage, if you think that might have influenced how you wrote her or how um, it was easier to write her as a black hole? Um, huh. Yeah, I'm going to say yes to that. Like in, in, uh, in Galore, there's a character who's known as the widow, right? And, uh, and that's all she's known as. And that conveys a certain character to a person. And, uh, and I, I do feel like that, that uh, the fact that that's the only way anybody refers to her confers a particular kind of character to her, a certain severity, a certain closed offness, and a certain absence at the center, right? The fact that the, what defines them in, in their eyes is that loss, I think does very much uh, connect up with this notion that there is nothing at the center. Like part of their desire for power, part of their desire to like control the world is because they don't have anything in the interior that feeds them at all, right? They are black holes. And that's why they are so vicious about making it seem as if everything in the world belongs to them alone. I don't know if that's a good answer to your question. He got a name. He had to have a name because uh, Abe and Keynes was the setup. <laughs> so, and it allowed me to make a joke about him being not able. <laughs> so, so that's fine. I will tell the story about the sister, though. I was walking home one day on my little cul-de-sac in St. John's, and there was a guy walking his dog who I see all the time walking his dog, but that's the only way I know him. And, uh, and you know, we usually say hello. And, uh, and this time he said, listen, I was just wondering, do you have a sister? And I was like, no, I don't. He said, oh, Jesus, thank God. I just finished your book. <laughs> so, uh, so I was quite happy not to have a sister. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I could have written that book if I had a sister. Just for that reason, you know? There's one right here. Back. Hi there. Hi. I've read The Innocence. I haven't read this one. <clears throat> But from the description, it sounds like this isn't a mirror, but it's through the mirror that things on the other side are twisted, confused, altered. What would you say? Um, yes, I love that. And in fact, I'm going to use that from now on. <laughs> I think that's probably a better description of, of how I see the book in my head. Because a mirror implies a one-to-one -one or a left-right altering. And that's not what's happening here at all. It's sort of like, as you say, it's taking that story and putting it through the looking glass and having everything on the other side be sort of recognizable, but not at all the same. So yes, I am definitely using that. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a question about your process, your writing process. Yeah. When you're researching for a book, is it a so is it a process of 
you have a story in your head, you start the writing and then you do some digging and then you go back to writing and back, is it a back and forth or is it more, I need to put the writing on hold for a few months and just dig for, I'm just curious about yeah. that process. Okay, no, um, that's a good question. I, um, I do feel like all of my books have arrived slightly differently and the process of writing them has been very different. Um, I know with like with this book, of course, I had already done a bunch of research for the innocence that was absolutely applicable to this one. So a lot of the research was already in place. Um, but I do research as I go as well. I do have to have, Jesus, and not to talk about physics again, but it does feel like uh, what I have in my head has to have enough weight that it has some kind of gravitational force and it starts pulling in other things, you know? So like before I had thought of this notion of there needs to be a sister, there just wasn't, a, nothing was coming to it, you know? It was just sitting there inert. And as soon as I started thinking, oh, there's a sister, all kinds of bits and pieces started circling in and glomming on to that bigger, to that piece. And it started to feel like a story. Um, but then of course, as I go, once, for example, I reached the point where there were pirates, I had to say, I had to step away from the book and find out a little bit more about uh, American piracy around that time. Um, so that's always going on, that back and forth. Um, but uh, a long time ago now, I decided that uh, the way, the best way for me to write a book once I start is to give myself a word minimum. Um, and, that, and that minimum is 500 words a day. And I find that even on the worst possible days, I, I can scrape out 500. And then if I go back to it next day and I erase 450, I still have 50 words that I wouldn't have. Um, and it just means that you're constantly moving the story ahead an inch a day, at least. Uh, and lots of days are way better than that. But it, it means that you never just throw up your hands and give up. You, you sit your ass in the chair and you do your 500 words. Uh, and that's been really important to me um, over the last four or five books. And we do have time for one more question. Oh, yes. Okay. We'll come back. Let the person in the front go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, you said that in the beginning, you said that you didn't want to be a historical novelist when you grew up. What kind of novelist did you want to be? <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> historical novelist. Rich and famous, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> that was my aim. Um, it's not working out real well. I mean, I'm doing great. I mean, look at my channel. <laughs> uh, and I really, I'm really. Well, honestly, I, I can't believe the life I have. I have um, my my real my only goal when I started writing, and I started out writing poetry. My real my the only goal I had in my head was maybe getting published in Tickle Lace Magazine, which was this little literary magazine that was published in St. John's. So to think that I've been doing this now for forty years almost, and um, and I'm not working at a corner store to pay the rent every month you know i feel incredibly lucky so but yeah i didn't really know what what kind of novels i wanted to be um and i've just kind of as i have with most things fallen forward into whatever's in front of me i'm uh, i'm so glad you mentioned poetry <laughs> um because this book passengers that came out last year um with i think comparatively little fanfare as, as compared to your novels which is a sin yeah it it's stunning thank you and so much you have been thinking a lot about the devil <laughs> <laughs> haven't we all <laughs> to, to the times um can i ask where you're from uh complex answer my family are from cornbrook right. uh, I, I grew up here yeah okay um I'm going to refer to my notes so I can ask the question I meant to ask. <laughs> um, in, in the Cain and Abel story, biblically, 
things go pear-shaped because hypothetically Abel was favored by God and Cain is pissed off. Yeah. Um, in your story, Abel is favored by a God, the patriarchy, um, and this widow Cain's, like Divine's widow, is in a way God's widow. She's, she's bereaved by the violence of the patriarchy that serves Abe. Um, so the God in charge is really more of a devil, sort of playing bad against bad just for meanness. And I'm interested if the, the clutch of poems here in Passengers, where you've got the devil walking up and down in Newfoundland, did that inform your process behind the adversary? Huh? You know, I had never made that connection. Um, the, the book of poetry, which came out last year, as she said, and um, uh, and in many ways, it's it's like it was never published in, in terms of the response from the world, you know. So thank you for bringing it up. Because <laughs> poetry was the reason I started writing. And for a long time, that's all I wanted to be. Um, but in the last section of that book, uh, it's it's called Devil's Skin, and which is a phrase Newfoundlanders use for someone who's getting out of hand or a kid who's a bit rowdy, and he's a real devil's skin. And um, uh, I had written a couple of pieces that where the devil just came up, and the devil's skin was something that was um, th that piece was uh, um, there was a magazine that uh, asked me to write something about a photograph from the archives. And uh, it was a photograph, I chose a photograph of the Newfoundland Regiment, boys from the Newfoundland Regiment. Um, and, and there were one or two other things. There was a Polish writer who had written a piece called Native Devil about the, uh, how the devil arrived in Poland and how he lived his life through several centuries there. And I thought, I'm gonna do that for Newfoundland. <laughs> and so uh, I started, once you start, writing two or three of those pieces, then you start thinking, well, what other kinds of devil lore is there in Newfoundland? And it turns out there's quite a bit. And so, and I was just really interested in placing this guy uh, in, in different circumstances in, as a way of maybe changing the way we think about it. Like there's one where uh, uh, it's, uh, um, He's at the uh, Sobeys, the Sobeys in, uh, what's the name of that square? I forget. Anyway, there's a huge Sobeys grocery store um, that was built over the uh, orphanage where hundreds of boys were uh, abused by brothers and priests over generations. And, and, you know, when it was first proposed that they were going to tear down that orphanage and put in a fucking grocery store, people were appalled. And now we're all there in their shopping carts and looking at the sales. And so I just thought it would be interesting to think, well, what if you put this guy in that? What, what would be in his head as he was walking those aisles? So I don't think it carried over. It, it feels like they were very separate. But maybe unconsciously, Yes, some of that was there. Anyway, it was a very long-winded answer to your question, but thank you. And I'll now turn things over to Chris and Michael, if you have any closing comments you might like to make before we lure Charlena. I would just like to say thank you. Thank you for the conversation, and thank you for coming. Thank you for these powerful novels. Amazing, thank you. Yeah, well, and I would just say, you know, I'm really glad I'm back, and, and I hope it happens again. Because I, when I finish a book, I never know. I always feel like that's it. We can count on an invitation to be yeah. here. Yeah, okay. So I hope to see you in about four years' time. Kind <laughs> of conversation, from my point of view, could have gone on for another hour. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you so much, Chris. When I first met Michael in my classroom all those years ago, and he sat in his lumberjack shirt and his ripped jeans and sat on the table, and the students all thought, wow, a writer looks like that? That's amazing. I want to do that. <laughs> he was writing poetry then, and uh, the, the sort of sensitive, thoughtful, uh, language-aware witness of culture, family, lore, and the really huge challenges that face us as, as humans in a, in, a, in a harsh environment. 
um, was there then, as, along with this uh, kind of modesty and willingness to share. Uh, you are an extraordinary person, Michael, and it's really, really great to have you back. Thank you for making another novel and for uh, sharing this extraordinary conversation tonight. A big hand, please. And he's pretty, well, he's pretty well dressed, though, don't you think? Like, do you like the jacket? You guys like the jacket? Yeah. Uh, this is the second last night of the festival. We have one more night to go. Uh, tomorrow night, we're gathering at Kilter Brewing for the annual haiku death match. Uh, very little blood is shed, but uh, a lot of laughs. And there's audience voting, so uh, you might want to join us over there at 7. Uh, we're teaming up again with McNally for uh, Wabigishi Rice, who is here on October 27th. So uh, mark that in your calendars. But I got to say that you could come back here again on Thursday night because uh, David Robertson is launching his next novel, The Masewa Saga, and he is going to be hosted by none other than Sheila Rogers, who is in the room right now. <laughs> Welcome, Sheila. And she's hiding back there, but uh, everyone turn around for a second so she can blush. There she goes. Maybe she'll talk to you on the way out and you can all kind of like live in that liquid sale. Uh, so come back uh, over and over again to this, uh, to this incredible store because that's one other thing I'd like to just pause to acknowledge that our hosts here at McNally Robinson uh, the bookseller himself sitting in the host chair and the Wizard of Oz behind the, uh, uh, the <laughs> they, they make this extraordinary space for us to gather regularly and to encounter one another in new ways and to encounter stories that we otherwise might not meet uh, and, to, and to have these extraordinary conversations together. So a huge round of applause, please, for this extraordinary place. Now, the rules. Uh, Michael is going to be transported safely <laughs> to the signing desk, which is over by the cash desk. Uh, there are books there at the, at the cash desk and at the signing desk, so you can either buy your book and then get in line to get it signed, or get it signed and then pay for it. But the rule here is you have to pay for the book before you leave the store. You just do it like that. Uh, so now you must all stay Stay where you are until Michael is safely ensconced in his new place. I think it's going to be a crowd surf or, I don't know, piggyback. Or... I'm really nervous about this now. <laughs> Should I make a run for it? <laughs> you Wait may for run, but you may not escape. Thank you so much.